This afternoon we have um, uh, the second of uh, Professor Hans Beiser's seminars. He gave one last week, but uh, for those of you who weren't at that one, I'll, I'll go through um, uh, the introduction to him again. So, uh, Professor Beiser was born in uh, Berlin in 1939 and did his, studied his physics in Berlin as well. Uh, then he took up positions in um, Kansas and at Göttingen, where in 1958 he did, he did his PhD, or completed his PhD. <laughs> Then he uh, got a job at um, the Shockley Transistor Corporation, where in uh, 1960 he completed the work on the uh, famous paper on detail ballots, which, for which he'll be given the history today, um, uh, and although it wasn't actually published until 1961. In 1963 he went to Bell Labs, um, and then... It, uh, I haven't quite got the year actually, but then you've got a professorship in Frankfurt. Uh, 67 or so, yeah. In about 67. Uh, before becoming the f founding director of the uh, Max Planck Institute for Solid State Physics at, in Stuttgart. Uh, and he's still there as a, and now as an emeritus director of the, uh, of the, of the centre. Um, and I'd like to introduce Hans Weiser to talk about data balance. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm very much uh, indebted to you that you take some interest. And uh, detailed balance is one topic. And of course, you all know this paper. You learn about it in uh, lectures and so on. Your battle cry is beat the detailed balance limit, right? That's your battle cry. And I wish you much luck and much success, you people of the ultimate new solar work. You. N S W. That's what you are. <laughs> However, uh, many people ask me about uh, my, my education and previous associations. And I would like to start with a little bit of anecdotal things concerning my boss, William Shockley. Because he was born almost 100 years ago in England, where his mother had some geological business to do. And he died in, in August 12, 1989. And just a few days before his death, we met at, the, um, at a certain room of the Stanford uh, Faculty Club. And he said, you know, Hans, well, thinking about it, I think we did something useful with this solar energy paper. Those were his last words to me. Shockley was a very difficult person. When I did my PhD in Göttingen, Bardeen came around to visit the Institute of Physics in Göttingen. And my boss said, this young man is going to join Shockley in California. And Bardeen came very close to me, looked me in the eye, and said, well, we'll see how you like Shockley. <laughs> I said, my god, this is terrible. But somehow I'll make it. And I really did. It was not easy. He was a very impatient, very tough, critical guy. Vain, you could not criticize him. I was almost fired because I used a different definition of a bore radius of a donor and acceptor. But I stayed on. And we did many things together. And at the end, he was really a very, very good mentor for me. So the important thing, which I want to uh, state again, is that at the Bell Telephone Labs, William Shockley used the ideas of Walter Schottky, the German theoretician, you know, of, of a Schottky barrier, of course, you know that. Schottky at Siemens did some very nice work to understand why in the world do certain elements, semiconductor elements, the word semiconductor is ugly, semi, you know, it's uh, not very good. So people didn't like it, and it was this ideal rectifier equation, which was proven experimentally and without any adjustable parameters, that's really something at that time, that really ended this enigma we could understand by the current being proportional exponentially to the voltage. There is an I sub s, which can be expressed by various things that you can separately measure, and you can see that the forward and the reverse characteristic of voltage versus current are really obeyed by this rectifier equation, which in turn then, of course, has something to do with the solar cells that we all are working on. And here you see what happened 
in the warm Christmas spirit of 1948 when the first amplifying germanium transistor was found. I may repeat that again for some of you, but Shockley said, we, that was his job, that's why he was hired by the people of American Telephone and Telegraph Company, we want to replace those energy devouring switches and slow relays which go broke all the time. We want to have a solid state equivalency of the tubes, the switches, and the relays. The president of Bell Telephone Laboratories at that time was a very tough Irishman, but he said there have been so many successful activities during World War II, especially on radar. You know that radar consumed more government monies in Britain, in particular, Royal Radar Institution, you know, Great Malvern, very nice spot, in the US and in Germany. And it decided the Battle of Britain, for example. People used some diodes. They did not know why they worked, but they used them. Oh, was, you had to do something there. And germanium and silicon with a little bit of aluminum on there and point contact for high frequency operation somehow worked. And the president of Bell Labs said, now we have all this information. You can still read about it in the, the early uh, books of the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the early radar stuff, how this worked. So Shockley said, OK, let's get out and do something with the semiconductor. And he said, we work with germanium. And his colleagues and friends and the people who actually paid him partly the engineers at the uh, Allentown Development Laboratories, they said, this guy is utterly crazy. Germanium, why that? It comes from the Belgian Congo, and there is civil war all the time, and it's costly. We have semiconductors already. We have selenium. We have cadmium sulfide. We have cuprous oxide that rectifies, and that's uh, uh, sensitive for photoconductivity. Why germanium? But Shockley said, we want to use simple things first. I want a cubic semiconductor with a low melting point, which can easily be cleaned and purified. And as you know, in 1948, the first point contact transistors, two contacts coming down on the base of a sheet of polycrystalline germanium. That's why the name base nowadays is being used, although the base is a very tiny, very narrow, thin spot in today's transistors. So an emitter contact, injecting something in it, and a collector, which took on and it amplified. So, and Shockley said, let's take an official picture. And he insisted, being the boss, to sit down and the others around him. This is Bardeen, a very fine person. As you know, two Nobel Prizes. And this is, he was our neighbor in Summit, New Jersey. We met him all the time. This is Bratton. A tinkerer. He was very good with his hands. But Shockley always said he, he didn't understand what a transistor was. But he was very useful in putting this little triangle down here. And Shockley said, I want to be, or we, we want to be photographed with a microscope. And this is very important because Shockley said, this is going to be a micro technique. And in his book, he has certain photos of small sensors and so on, measuring small things. Previously, just think of the Sydney Opera House or the Sydney Bridge or the Eiffel Tower. Big things were the ones that made people famous. And with a microscope of a man-made thing, that was very rare. People, of course, looked through microscopes in living organisms, bacteria, and so on. But this was something that was man-made and needed microscopes. And nowadays, of course, if you really want to do nice work, you even go to a transmission electron microscope. So, but they went on and they said, well, then we make transistors, three terminal devices with a base, a big contact, and then put some needles on there. And the first publication of transistors in physical review was authored by Bardeen and by Bratton. Shockley said, no, I will not be a co-author simply because I'm the boss. And I think that's very important. You should not be a co-author simply because you're a boss of a group. And he said, this is not what we are looking for. We are looking for something that happens 
inside the material. The electronic functions must be inside, not outside, a shaky, wobbly thing with two needles. So he was a little unhappy. So Bardeen and so on, you'll hear rumors that uh, Shockley forbade Bardeen sort of things and so on. Yeah, it was difficult. He, he was a little aggressive and, and very tough on people. But he briefly after this had to go to Chicago. There was a snowstorm, which is something that you never experience here. <laughs> there was a big snowstorm. And I tell you, Chicago snowstorms can be uh, something. So he was sitting in a hotel, not being able to take a train or that time already plane back to New Jersey, where the Bell Labs were. So he was sitting there, and he developed then the complete theory of the PNPN transistor. No longer with outside point contacts, but with things inside. The emitter injecting electrons through a very thin base layer and went all the time to the collector junction. Then he told me this very often. We had lots of time together traveling by air from California to our money sponsoring agencies in Boston and in Washington and in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. So he, he told me all kinds of stories, which I now retell to you. He said, you know, Hans, it was very funny. I tried to give a good, simple talk to make people understand what the PN junction transistor should be. Very clever people at Bell Labs. But when I finished the talk, I did not understand. So I must have done something wrong. But he tried and continued. And as you know, the PN, NPN transistor was eventually the material of choice, was germanium at that time. Although, of course, you know that germanium, having such a small energy gap, is very sensitive to temperature changes. It, at a day yesterday, for example, which wasn't the coldest, uh, we had experienced for quite some time. If you had a germanium transistor in your car radio, it wouldn't work because the high temperature KT would elevate so many electrons from its valence band into the conduction band that it overcame what you put in there by doping. So you had to go to a different material, namely silicon. But this was then the beginning of emitter, base, collector, transition, and the forward current and so on. Shockley explained this. This must have been that uh, historically famous representation or presentation of uh, the transistor activity at Bell Labs, and nobody understood it. Very interesting. But if it's really something new, you have problems. Science seems to be going by continuation, like an analytical continuation. And if you have something totally new, people will say, oh, we haven't heard of that. So this happens. Shockley wrote a book. I don't know if you have it in your library, if anybody has it in his possession. If so, look, try to find it. Maybe you can get it uh, in an antique idea. Electrons and Holes in Semiconductors by Van Ostrand in New York. Actually, they had their offices in Princeton by William Shockley, member of the technical staff of the Bell Telephone Laboratory. Second printing. Shockley said, my, I want to have this book called Holes and Electrons in Semiconductors. Because the idea of a hole as a missing electron in an otherwise complete a multitude of electrons was very important. People at that time really didn't like the word holes. And then the idea, they said, it's only electrons in there. And the electrons jump into the empty spaces and so on. All conductivity, all conduction is electronic. So if I remember even when coming back to Germany, speaking of holes, people said, ah, is that really something? But of course, it is if you go to quantum mechanics. The idea, Dirac did it very beautifully, of a missing partner in an otherwise complete multitude. So holes and electrons and semiconductor. But the people at Van Nostrand said, oh, sir, no, we don't do that. Holes, ah, that sounds. Um, bizarre and maybe even a little dirty or so. No, no. Can we just do it semiconductors? No, Shockley insisted. OK, compromise. Electrons first, holes second, and in semiconductors. And here, uh, this was very nice when sometime I, I left Hans Quasar May, the stepping stone of your scientific cre creations in Palo Alto. That's where we had the laboratory. 
our cornerstone successful career in physics. Very nice. So we had a very nice relation at the end, not in the beginning. I got a phone call from my professor in Göttingen, famous university in you know, Heisenberg and Born and, and Frank and so on. And he said, I have here a letter from a guy in California, Shockley, who wants a, somebody, a person who is interested in defects. And that was essentially my PhD thesis subject. So I accepted and went to California. A colleague picked me up in 59, that was, at the San Francisco airport and showed me this thing. He said, this is our laboratory. That's the front part of our laboratory. I said, what? A Nobel laureate. He had just gotten the Nobel Prize for the f transistor in 56. This was three years later. This is our laboratory. It was an old apricot barn. This used to be what is now Silicon Valley, used to be a very beautiful area of fruit trees. Wonderful in the spring, all the blossoms and so on. And they had stored apricots in this thing. And that is really the cradle of Silicon Valley. Shockley wanted to continue work on silicon, not in germanium anymore, not for the reason that physics gives him, because it has a larger band gap than germanium and uh, is substantially different n sub i. No, he wanted to make one device which he thought would really revolutionize switching of telephones and in telecommunication, namely a four-layer diode. I don't want to go into detail here. Structure and typical voltage current characteristics of the diode. If you want to know more, please read my good friend uh, Simon C's book on physics of semiconductor devices. Only thing I want to show you, V versus I, it has an off region, very low current, high voltage, and it has an on region, very high current, very low voltage. And you can switch between these two things from one to the other. Seems very nice, but it's a two uh, terminal device, which for reasons I explained before, is not very good, and it did not function. It did not make it. We tried to make these things with silicon, but people prefer transistors. So when I joined Shockley, he said, hello, welcome. You have two projects at first, solar cells. Okay. We have two government contracts. Most of the money is spent already, but very little of the experimentation has been done. So you better take care of that, which meant, <laughs> I tell you, oh yeah, don't you laugh. I had to set the alarm clock, go into the lab, take a diffusion, go to the fusion furnace, take a diffusion out, put another one in and so on, really working day and night, like a good physicist should do, like you all, of course, are doing. So. Then we got to the detailed balance limit. And let's see if you want to read a little bit more. There is a very nice book by Bo Lojek, Lojek, History of Semiconductor Engineering, a very recent one. And here you have a English language uh, translation of a German word. You know, I seem to like alliterations, Kristall and Krisen. The crystal had to go through many crises in order to really be accepted. And it's called the micro, the conquest of the microchip. And it is easily readable. I wrote it essentially for female trade union people, because the unions in Germany were heavily against microelectronics. It almost failed to be instituted. And it is not really, we still suffer in Germany from the fact that the unions were against it. The left-wing people were against it. It would cost jobs, they said. It will be automation. Many things will be simply replaced by these microprocessors. We don't want that. OK, so here is the book again, translation. And you see some important people here. You see Shockley looking through the microscope. Here you see Walter Schottke, a remarkable theoretician. He was the one who said, it has to do this rectification with the junction. And we can measure the junction, for example, by capacitance voltage. You know all this. Yeah, that's what you do all the time, by capacitance voltage measurements. OK. This is my hero, Braun, who was the inventor of the first rectifier. 
very long time ago when he was a school teacher and he measured rectification, nobody believed him. People said, Ohm's law has nothing to do with the direction of the current, so it's all nonsense you're reporting here. And Pooh Brown, well, he was, however, a man of good humor. He invented, essentially, the first transistor, and he invented in Strasbourg, which at that time was German, after the Prussian-Franco uh, War. He invented the uh, cathode ray set up. They measured actually the 60 hertz variation of current and voltage. And here is another hero of mine. He was for a short time my boss, Max von Laue. The president of the Max Planck Society said, Max, we need somebody to take care of this one institute in Berlin, my hometown, where I was uh, an intern, I think you would say. And uh, I had read, of course, of Max von Lauer, very clever theoretician. And von Lauer said, yes, I'll visit the institute before I make a decision to be the director of this uh, institute in Berlin, where Scheffler, for example, is, and I think you know him, uh, Matthias Scheffler and others. So Lauer said, I'll come by at about 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, no Lauer. 11.30, no Lauer. 12.30, no Lauer. And then the senior people in my department said, well, very bad, but we have vouchers. We have little things to get our lunch. Lunch, very important in Germany in 1949. We have to go, but I was just an intern. I had no rights and so on, so I had to bring a brown baggie, just like you do all the time. And uh, <laughs> I was sitting there and eating my sandwich, knock at the door. Lauer comes in, together with the chief administrator. I yes, said, where is everybody? I said, they had gone to lunch. Oh, Herr Professor, no, no, no. Then, no, no. But Lauer said, do you hear somebody? Yeah, you show me. So I had the great advantage, as a guy who knew very little about physics, to show Max von Lauer our complete uh, department. We were doing work on luminescence detectors and so on, and Lauer liked it. And I liked Lauer, who, by the way, however, gave exceedingly bad lectures. Very hard to understand. <laughs> Lousy lectures, but he was a fine gentleman. And later, when I was president of the German Physical Society, I got the German post office to issue a special stamp on him with a beautiful Lauer diagram. They are beautiful, you must admit. Very nice on top and to celebrate him. So, so much for Herr von Lauer. And I think that's it. And can we now maybe change it to the other thing? Now I want to come to the detailed balance part of it. I've bothered you with anecdotes so far, OK? And here's some work on solar energy. <laughs> and you see, this is a very ancient project. Here is the pharaoh and his underlings, so the director, the assistant directors, and the students. <laughs> the sun comes down, and the pharaoh says, we have to capture the sun, and we have to do some way of storing the energy. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Also, it is interesting that this pharaoh did not survive. He wanted to do away with the many, many gods and the many priests and the many temples and just have one monotheistic religion, the sun. People didn't like it. The concerted union of the priests said, no, we don't want just one sun, one god. We want many. So they kicked him out, more or less, destroyed his works, and so on. And please, be careful. This could happen to other people working on solar energy. For example, a concerted action of the fossil people, coal, oil, gas, maybe even fusion and so on. They will say, we can do much better than solar. So beware and continue your excellent work here at the University of New South Wales, please. So now about detailed balance, lifetimes and efficiency. 
So Shockley said, well, we have two projects. When I first came in November of 1959, we have two projects, both uh, financed by the government, because you must remember, this was the time of the Sputnik shock in the United States. You cannot imagine in the present time what a shock this was to the pride and self-confidence of the United States of America, that the Russian, the Soviets, had first shot something into space with a little beep beep signal, which, by the way, was powered by solar cells. Later, a good friend from the Soviet Academy of Science told me, we knew that we wanted to shoot up a thing. We needed some energy. We thought about little reactors, decided against it. But we thought that solar cells would be nice. So every Soviet diplomat, in his diplomatic baggage, unchecked, took away some solar cells from California, Hoffman, and International Rectifier, and so on. So beep, beep, first splitting. And then, of course, suddenly the Americans said, oh my goodness, we have to do something. And suddenly, plenty of money for solar cells. So I asked Shockley, well, if we have these two contracts, will we make solar cells? Oh, no, 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 Shockley said, no. We will not make solar cells, but we use it to understand silicon better, because I want to make my four-layer diodes, PNPN, which rely on the non-ideality of the current versus voltage curve. Silicon has a larger band gap than germanium. And if you have any defects inside the larger uh, space charge region between emitter and collector, or between P and John, there will be a substantial current flowing through these defects, especially at lower voltages, where you cannot fully utilize the high density of states of the thermal activation. So he said, we must understand silicon. A colleague of mine, Adolf Götzberger, who many of you know is the previous director of the Freiburg Institute, he worked on the reverse characteristic and me on the forward characteristic. So we still are good friends, and we still remember our division of labor. So detailed balance. PN junctions, ideal rectifier equation, I've told you already that I deem this to be a very important step. And you must understand that one thing that people had not really expected was that the lifetime of a minority carrier, an electron and p-type germanium, for example, was so long. If you go back and look at the very early ideas, Mott and Gurney, for example, the idea that you had long lifetimes was not really assumed. In the Schottky barrier, lifetime doesn't play such a big role. But the long lifetimes that people had measured in germanium, beautiful experiments, not so easy to be uh, done today, but uh, they measured with photoconductivity. Of course, you can get a quick measurement of the lifetimes of electrons and holes as minority carriers. So the question arose, what might be the longest possible lifetime in a highly perfect piece of germanium? Lifetime recombination and all that, Shockley once told me, we just looked at the textbooks of plasma physics, where there's also generation, ionizing radiation, for example, and recombination in the plasma, positive and negative charges. So they took over the terminology and some of the theoretical basis of this and looked at it. And Willy van Roosbroek, a very nice Belgian man, I liked very much. I later worked a lot with him on totally different ideas. Willy van Roosbroek, a slightly complicated but knowledgeable man, very kind guy, was asked by his boss Shockley, Willy, you look at the maximum possible lifetime of a minority carrier. How can that be done? Well, the idea was very simple. You look at the recombination and you look only at the radiative recombination and compare it to the radiative absorption. You compare absorption, alpha, and look at it, how it re-radiates. And there has, has to be a balance. And it has to be detailed. The balance has to be detailed, which means it has to be applied for every frequency of the incoming light. So you look at this, compare the two, and you take the absorption curve, alpha, as a function of h nu, of the photons, and you fold it with a black body uh, radiation uh, Max Planck's formula of the two. And then you see what the outcome is, and you get an idea of the shape. 
end of the lifetime. And Van Roosburg did this. It's a fairly short but interesting publication in Physical Review. You see, very old times, 54. And out came that the lifetime in germanium ought to be almost a second or so. Very long. Oh, that, that cannot be. Well, by that time, people had known that the mass of calculations to understand band structure, the uh, energy as a function of wave vector k, that germanium belonged to that family of materials which is indirect, so to speak, which has no direct transition of an electron and a hole because they're located at different spots in k space. The valence band of germanium and of silicon is at k equal to zero at the gamma point, and the uh, conduction band somewhere else. So you need phonons to help you do the recombination. So the consequence of this calculation was lifetimes can be very long if it's only radiative recombination and no non-radiative recombination involving phonons. And therefore, we have to consider that germanium, our favorite uh, transist uh, transistor material at that time, is indirect. So we used the same thing, and you can read it in the paper, which was uh, written by us in the late 59 when I joined Chalkley. My first uh, project was to make a multi-cell of silicon, multi-solar cell, using diffusion into very, very thin. Uh, this is, of course, your field now, extremely thin layers, diffusion from this and that side, and then interconnecting various batteries. And actually, got 10 volts out. That's what the government wanted. People at Monmouth, the US Signal Corps, wanted not to get high currents out, but also high voltage. And the hope was that one could make sheets of silicon very cheaply by pulling it off from a lead silicon melt and so on. So this was, at that time, the basic idea. <clears throat> and then we could calculate the efficiency. And I think you've seen this. Plotted here is the efficiency eta in percent. Stops somewhere here near 30, from 0 to 30. As a function, it's a one parameter theory only. The energy gap is characteristic for the material. At that time, people did not know what indeed would constitute the best material for a solar cell. There was a very powerful group in Princeton, the old RCA laboratory, some very good people, Rappaport, Lefersky, Al Rose and his group, and they said it will be the two sixes and maybe even the three fives. Uh, last time I told you the story about gallium arsenide and the surface recombination, I won't repeat that. So, they said it will be the two sixes. There was another very active group in Cleveland, Ohio, very good, also in two sixes. Cadmium sulfide, for example, was a very nice and loved material because it had such a good photoresponse that was used in sensors, in uh, photo exposure meters, and so on. So these people said this will be the best. Other people, had given a simple idea of what the photo cells, the solar cells, best application would be. And this is the work by Morton Prince, very nice guy who had a very simple idea. He said, let's look at the IV curve. That's why I showed this to you and stressed its importance. Shine light on it. That shifts the entire I of V curve downwards. So portions go through the fourth quadrant which means energy can get out. That theory and that of the others needed a detailed understanding of the current versus voltage characteristic. Germanium is fine. It's ideal. That's why I showed it to you to tell you really this was very important. But in two sixes, no. You had to replace the exponential with something that QV charge times voltage over N kT where n is a fudging parameters, sometimes going up all the way to 5. We make some reference in our paper that we think, and I still believe this is true, that it is defects within the space charge layer of a p-n junction that gives you these high values. But of course, if you then use the old idea of Morton Prince of just shifting an IV curve with this 
additional parameter ideality factor, which is a misnomer, as I told you, I dislike it strongly, because the more non-ideal the junction is, the higher is this ideality factor, so that doesn't make sense. Okay, so you couldn't do it that way. And that's why we made a theory that had nothing in principle to first effect to do with the current voltage curve, but we said if we have only rated the free combination for a material, we get this curve F. And if we take a factor that gives you the percentage of the non radiative recombination, it goes down here. This cross with I is, was the best solar cell in the infra green regime. By infra green, you know what I mean? It was before. Martin's and your all activity. So it was something like 14, 15%. And we, said, we thought that if we can somehow try to suppress the non radiative recombination, we should get into this range. We looked at various things, wrote a paper, submitted it to the Journal of Applied Physics. Mr. Krumhansel at Cornell was at that time the editor. Paper came back with a letter and a, a really angry Shockley came in and said, look at this, Hans, look at this letter. They rejected it. And here is a report of the referee. It says nothing new. It's a rehash of old things. What shall we do? And I said, oh, have to look at what the referee says. And then it took us half a year of very careful thinking and writing. And if you read the paper now, you can still see it lots of footnotes and so on. We tried to quote everybody in sight so that uh, as now, of course, if you don't quote your referee, he will reject the paper. This is a terrible thing, but that's what it is. And so we rewrote it. By the way, I did my calculations not with a computer. Oh, no. That was much too early and much too expensive. I had a slide rule, a special slide rule coming from Manchester, England. And this Mancunian device gave me the property of really calculating it. So I was sitting there, shifting it around, had a t to the 4 scale and everything very nice, so could do the calculation. So we resubmitted, and then it was accepted for publication in the Journal of Applied Physics in 1961. Nobody was interested. Just like the solar cell as a whole was not interesting. The early solar cell built in 1954 at Bell Labs by my very good friends and colleagues, Gerald Pearson, very fine man, great cigar smoker, good lecturer. Then Calvin Fuller, excellent chemist, with whom I later worked on gallium arsenide and defects and so on. They said, well, wrote a very little thing. If you look, go back and look at the first paper on the solar cell in Journal of Applied Physics, it's a very brief thing. And later on, Gerald Pearson had to write a little summary for the American Physics Teachers Organization. And he said, well, it's interesting, but not much use. The power output is too small. And also, the Bell Laboratories being part of the quasi-monopoly of AT&T, American Telephone Telegraph, was protected by the government as a quasi-monopoly, but at the expense of giving all the new results first to Washington. So Shockley and some colleagues had to go to the Pentagon and show the military what the solar cell could do. Solar cell, the general uniform people you know, looked at this and said, oh, no, 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 much too little output. You cannot give this to our soldiers in the field. They will continue having batteries, little battery packs. So no idea. You go ahead and have patents out on it, and you can publish. And as I told you before, only the Soviets did it. So here again, applied forward bias and current density. And you see the optimum is only radiative recombination. This factor that suppresses the radiative effect is, he, he is equal to 1. And this is an area which is totally excluded. You want things to happen as far to the right on this plot, as far up uh, on the forward bias. So we thought somewhere here might be a physical limit. 
We looked at the various things which could be against you. One, of course, as I told you before, the Auger recombination talked to Peter Landsberg, a very capable, very nice man who told us, but told us a little late. So I was late in uh, getting the report done at Wright-Patterson Airfield in Dayton, Ohio. People looked at me, you're late in getting this report. And what's in there? Ah. So they didn't like it either. So I said, well, if they don't like it, and nobody quotes us, I do other things where I was hired for defects. I did a lot of work on dislocations, point defects, and so on. But now, including you, very nice people quote this paper, although it's really old, at least once a week. This is what the people who do bibliometry, bibliometry or whatever you call it, a sleeping beauty paper. It sleeps, and then people like you, princes like you, from New South Wales, <laughs> have to go there, kiss it, and suddenly the paper is being accepted, which is like, I find it very interesting, very nice, and totally unrealistic. So what were the <laughs> assumptions we had in the detailed balance limit? Because if you want to beat the detailed balance limit, you have to look at the assumptions we made and we had to make, because that was our job for this particular government contract. One son, yeah. Now, of course, you people here and Andrew Blakers, concentrators, uh, are looking at several sons. I actually did some calculations with my slide rule, simply going on with the calculation, found that if you really have concentration, this is reducing entropy, and you get a higher efficiency plus the higher number of photons. So one son, and of course, the massive work that's currently being done on concentrator cells is going on like that, but you may have to cool these things. You have to have mechanical gadgets and so on. So it's not so easy to improve the efficiency at the same time when increasing the cost. That's not the idea, but you know better than myself how this is. The second is 1pn junction, which was a logical thing for us at that time, although we made some little statements in our paper in the later version. But you know, of course, also, and you do it here, and people in, in Freiburg and in uh, Boulder, Colorado, or Golden Colorado are doing this. If you have several junctions nicely stacked, first absorbing the blue and then at the end the red, and you have some knowledgeable ways to create contacts, tunneling contacts and so on, eh, not easy, very nice physics, then you can get much more out, 40, 41, 42 percent. So this we did not consider because we were told not to do it. One pair per photon, I discussed that in the previous talk, just to remind you, there is more energy in the blue and even in the green regime of the solar radiation. You could do more than just one electron hole pair. It can be done. We did it in the very nice dissertation of Sabina Kolodinsky. She did a very good job. But again, it's not so easy. And then no deep centers. This is something that we mentioned because at that time many people said if you put a deep center into the material you can catch many of the red photons. They will give you an electron, maybe also a hole. But we definitely state that you probably have more recombination that's deadly to the junction cell than you have improved uh, absorption. So deep centers I know that you're all working on it. It's going to be difficult, but maybe there is something here. So the detailed balance limit of efficiency, hardly quoted here, and now suddenly quoted, and it's very up high here. But you can really distinguish the, the periods of political and economic interest in the solar cell. The first uh, onset uh, of the oil crisis, and then here the green thing, and this is another thing that's not so important. So if you want to read the, uh, a material on detailed balance, which is a little bit more modern. Uh, you can read it in Material Science and Energy B. That was a talk I gave at uh, the Strasbourg Conference of the European Material Science, and uh, Material Science Group, EMS. And I'm surprised and I'm happy that apparently people are still interested in it. And I thank you 
for attending this little seminar. Thank you.